You're listening to the Dudes and Dads Podcast, a show dedicated to helping men be better dudes and dads by building community through meaningful conversation and storytelling. And now, here are your hosts, Joel DeMont and Andy Lehman. Joel. Joel's here. I'm not dead, dude. You're welcome back. <laughs> it's, oh, it's so good to be here, Andy. Really, really good to be here. Yes, it is been a long time since we've been in studio together and it's awesome yep i uh, i blame a few things uh primarily travel baseball uh and uh and just it's been a it's been a busy season of uh with uh, the new the new executive job blah 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 but you know what i said enough enough of that get my priorities straight right get back in the studio with my best friend and here we are for another great episode looking forward to it um uh any any th- what, do, should we do we need to catch up on anything is i don't there, think so is there any life uh any major life happenings i've been on autopilot clearly <laughs> clearly well, for a while right no Just i think we're zooming think along we're good yeah 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 it's uh it's one of those things guys and we've uh and i should say first of all a major shout out to our good friend uh jason weir who's been helping this show uh, in my absence, along with some other great people that have been on and around. And and Andy, um, I just should say from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you for showing me that I am so easily replaceable. That's <laughs> no, really that's what, not I, what I said. That's no, no, no. what I wanted to just put out there. <laughs> that uh. even a trained monkey could come in and... Uh, Are you calling Jason a trained monkey? I'm not. No, I'm just saying even below... The level of other of other uh, guest hosts, uh, clearly, if it's you and a train monkey, the show could can, go on. Can go on, all right. Could go on. So, uh, what are we what are we what are we talking about this so, time, Andy? Tonight we have uh, Sean Clifford on with us. Uh, welcome to the show, Sean. Uh, we'll get here to your like who you are and why you have you on. But welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on. So, so Sean actually uh, is a father also. So we'll, we like to start with our dad stats, which yeah, usually means Sean. tell us about your kids, your wife, your family. What do you like to do? Father of four. Oh, got, yes. Uh, At a boy. Yeah. Uh, four kids, nine-year-old daughter, and then three boys behind at seven, four and a half. We can't forget that. And then two years old. Gotcha. And awesome. so it's a busy season of life, especially since we're potty training the youngest Ooh. right now. Oh, may God be with uh, you. Which is, yeah. Um, you know, I have had work trips for the first three to just so happen to coincide, and it did not work out this time. So <laughs> we're uh, working through that now. Um, coming up on 14 years of marriage to my wife, who's amazing um, and still puts up with me and is uh, is just great. So Living here in Austin, Texas, we moved here about five years ago. It's been fantastic for us. The city's kind of a boom town now and is a great fit. I'm originally from New Mexico. My wife is from Tallahassee, Florida. It's southern enough for her to get sweet tea, western <laughs> enough for me to get green chili. That's right. And so we're kind of in the sweet spot, and I think we're in our forever home. We're just, we're here. We love it. We've got a tribe to do life with, and very grateful. That's awesome. Well, we wanted to talk with you a little bit tonight because you are the CEO of a company uh, called Canopy. Uh, but can you tell us, just in a nutshell, what Canopy does, and then we'll go deep in a little bit more deeper into to that. Absolutely, Canopy is a digital parenting app. We've created software that you would put on your child's devices, smartphone, tablet, or computer, and it effectively delivers your child a porn-free internet experience. It deters sexting and helps make sure that there's some guardrails up as they get on devices and navigate this crazy new digital world that we live in. That that's great. I know, you know, I'm uh, I'm parenting kids that are of the age that have, you know, that age group has ten, you know, is exposed to porn and things like that. Joel is, sounds like you are too, uh, cuz what is the average age now that that kids are actually seeing porn? It is a great question. Three years ago, New York Times said that it was around 13 years old for boys. Uh, Two years ago, I saw that it was about 11 years old. And now the the last research that I've seen says somewhere between 8 and 11 uh, is the average exposure to hardcore pornography. Man, that's tough. And as a parent, we don't have a whole lot of options. I know know that myself, I have an iPhone. Joel, you have an Android. And 
There's yeah, just thanks for pointing that out. Appreciate <laughs> you. There's just Green not. Bubble. <laughs> <laughs> there's not a lot that you can do. I mean, I can lock it down a little bit, but I found the things that I struggle with is having my kids being able to access the things that they need to access while keeping them away from from things that they don't want, need to access. Uh, you know, I can lock down. I can take away the Safari browser, but they that doesn't help them because it, it, it neuters the whole thing. Yeah, that's exactly right. And like we at Canopy are pro tech. We think these things are amazing and they are as uh, ubiquitous as they are because they're compelling, whether it's for education or social life. And like on that point, the average uh, social life of American teenagers today revolves around their devices. Their digital life is their social life. Very difficult to separate out or keep it up with family, especially over uh, you know the last year with the pandemic. Like these things played such an incredible important role in our life and yet as you allude like it's a pipe it can bring fresh water into your home or sewage sometimes both at the exact same time and it's complicated and it's really challenging so it's challenging enough just like from a technological perspective i also think one thing that's tricky is that we're the first generation that's really wrestling with this mm. meaning right there have been you know pornography is age old uh there have always been parenting challenges but we're the first generation that is really trying to figure out hey, what does a uh, healthy use of a smartphone look like for my kid? Or how to figure out Snapchat and like what etiquette around that is or things like that. And it's brand new and it's hard. And we're kind of stumbling our way forward trying to figure it out as we go, uh, which is never fun because, know. Uh, you know, with kids, the stakes are high, right? right. So not, not to like put pressure on it, but these things are pretty formative and powerful. And so we want to make sure that uh, we get it right. So, so tell me a little bit about the the company itself. When was it founded? Um, I've just heard about it here when uh, you, just recently. So, I, I when was the, the the company founded? Canopy itself was founded in 2019. We just staged our product launch in the United States in March of this year. So, we're just getting out uh, into market in the states here, which is very exciting for us. But the technology itself was developed in Israel. Uh, from a company that was founded about 13 years ago and has been off to the races there. In Israel today, the same technology is protecting about 2 million devices and about 90% of the schools. And so they've kind of taken it, developed it, and we're bringing it over here to American families. That's awesome. So tell me a little bit about how you how your app works. Yeah, so the app is something, again, you would download to uh, your child's device, and then it works in the background. And it basically is a next generation internet filter. The thing I love about it is how it actually works, like the tech that's like under the hood. So two amazing things happened in Israel that kind of make this possible. The first is they trained artificial intelligence to identify nudity and pornography in 99%, uh, 99.7% accuracy. Wow. So basically there's this machine over there. We're still trying to figure out what to call the machine. We <laughs> think it should have a name. Yeah. Uh, but Tom, Tom is one option. So Tom is really good at figuring out what is nudity and pornography. Mm -hmm. So that's the first advance. The second advance is we figured out how to make that decision in real time, in milliseconds. So when you bring those two things together, we basically scan every website that you go to as you get there. And in 20 to 60 milliseconds, which should not be detectable to the human eye, we're able to see if any of the words, images, or videos on that page contain nudity or pornography. If too much of it's bad, we'll just block the whole page. If there's only a few bad things, we'll just pull that out and serve up all the good content. Whoa, so that's cool. it's kind of a real time AI based next gen solution to this that we think gives you the good of the internet without the bad. So uh, tell me a little bit if I have a device, I, I obviously you know, Safari is not the only browser in you know on the phone or uh, Google, whatever, <laughs> Chrome, they're on your device there, Joel. Uh, but but if I'm, let's say I'm in an app that has an in-app browser, how do, does your, does the app work the same way? Does it still, is it still able to filter that stuff out? Yes, we filter within all asterisks, almost all browsers. We don't do DuckDuckGo or Brave just because they have encryption that blocks sure. our filter. So we just take those offline. But every other browser we're able to filter with that. Both a like dedicated app browser like Safari or Chrome or in-app browsing and that last part is so critical, as you alluded, because 
you know, for a lot of other filters, one of the big ways that kids can get around it is like they open up Google Maps, they'll type in some adult store, they then click on the website and like they're off, they're off to the races. Mm -hmm. But from the filters perspective, they're like into cartography and just kind of yeah. checking out, you know, some of the nearby maps. Um, and but they've effectively evaded the filter. So that's obviously not helpful. So we're able to catch all internet browsing activity on the device kind of irrespective of where it is. That's awesome. So from the, the standpoint of like, okay, if I, I'm thinking of um, especially my two eldest boys who uh, at any, they don't have phones, but they are trying to steal mine all the time to watch all their YouTubers that they're interested in all of, all of that stuff. Um, what like, like with, um, and I guess to the point I'm thinking about how they use it specifically like on YouTube. So for instance, um, like every once, like every once in a while, they'll be watching a YouTube channel and I can hear it in the background and like the YouTube channels that they watch are like, oh, they're like, um, uh, people with like hobby farms and like things like, you know, things like, like pretty mundane, like harmless sort of, sort of stuff. But every once in a while, there'll be like an ad that like a an ad that pops in the middle of it, whatever. And the content of that ad is like way more adult than the like the rating of the, like, the video that of, of the video that they're watching or whatever things like things like that. So I just wonder, like how like if, if they were watching a video per se, like on a YouTube on a YouTube channel, how would your software? Be, would it be interacting with that at all, or would it be just would would that be a separate thing altogether? So let me take this from two different directions. Sure. One, YouTube is such a big platform unto itself that our customers, the way we've set up our app with respect to YouTube, is we kick YouTube onto the kid mode, okay, or the safe mode. Gotcha. And the reason for that is um, our app or our filter is identify nudity and pornography but there's a lot of content out there that doesn't include that but still is not safe for kids right mm -hmm. and so that's where we push it okay. um and we think that addresses most of the concerns for you yep. let me take a different streaming platform like uh vimeo or sure. any yep. other website out there yep. we're able to scan a hour-long video in under three seconds and what we're doing is we're checking um if any of the content within it is problematic and so let's say that the first 45 minutes is fine and you get to minute 46 and there's something bad there. We'll catch that and then we'll still make sure that we're, we're blocking that. We're not splicing within it. Companies that have tried to do that get into copyright issues. Mm, yeah. So we're just taking videos that contain that problematic content offline. And so uh, we think that's kind of a way that gives you the peace of mind that you're, they're just not going to be exposed, even if it's hidden in there, or tucked away at the end or anything gotcha. like that. Yep. Yep, that's good. Yeah, because I think I know I've had plenty of conversations with my wife about like, you know, we think we have set for streaming services or things like that. We think we have the settings appropriate. And her concern is always like, yeah, but like what if someone manages to sneak that? You know, it's like I, and this is just the nature of, of my wife's attitude toward it. Like even if it's a one in a million shot, she's still concerned about it kind of thing, you know. So and obviously there's no like. 100% guarantee foolproof sort of thing. But really what yeah. I hear you saying is is that to the greatest degree possible you're able to, you know, quickly scan and and pre and and I think that's a really interesting thing because it's so oftentimes the video will start off just fine even if I'm sitting there with my kids and be like, "Okay, I I get the idea what this content is. This seems good or whatever." And then and her, you walk away, uh, walk away. And my wife's comment is, is like, well, you don't know what's at minute 73 or like what, you know, or yeah. whatever. Um, and so, uh, and I go, I, I, I guess, I, I yeah. guess. Sure. Okay. Uh, so that, uh, sounds to me like that's what you're saying there and like how you guys operate basically addresses that concern as well. So that's super handy. And uh, yes. makes me feel that I can sound smart in front of my wife when she asks me <laughs> the next time about the what if the what if scenario. Or you could watch every YouTube video. Yeah, you could do that. All of them, <laughs> just to make sure. Oh my gosh! Yeah, uh, yeah. You did mention sexting, and how does that work with like that's is the in app or the you know the normal uh, uh, text uh, text app? Okay, there it is. I couldn't think of the word. Uh, does that does your app work with a normal text app or do you have to text through through a certain app? 
Great question. So the way that our anti-sexting feature works right now is that we scan photos that you take on a smartphone when they hit the memory of the device. So if you open up your camera, you take a picture, we'll scan it. I should note, this is an opt-in feature. Uh, and so this is only done if parents want this. Uh, and it's never accessible by anyone on our team ever. Um, but so what happens is like, let's say that you've got a 16 year old that takes their camera, they snap a photo of themselves and it's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Our software then kicks in a warning message that says, hey, are you sure you meant to take that photo? <laughs> at that point, they've got two choices. They can delete it or they can send it to mom for approval, oh. which um, if it really is inappropriate, uh, hopefully they wouldn't do that. Hopefully that's a deterrent effect. But right. a couple of things about why we built it that way. First is just by posing it as a question, we want to like, we, we don't want this to be a domineering, blocking, like in your face, um, you did something wrong type of tool. We don't think that's ultimately constructive. And we want to encourage kids to think about how they are uh, engaging in the digital world and just kind of create that one buffer layer, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we built it that way. Um, for this anti-sexting feature, we've got two different options. We can do pure nudity or we can do minimal clothing. So let's say it's lingerie or bikinis or things like that. And so we're able to, that's just for sexting. For the internet, we're just doing nudity. Mm -hmm. But uh, the stats out there around sexting are just like mind boggling. Before the pandemic, um, one out of four American kids had received a sext, one out of seven had sent one. The Google search for how to sext tripled in the first month of the Whoa. pandemic. And uh, it's now gotten to the point that two thirds of all American high school girls have been asked to send nude photos of themselves. And this often happens right when they show up as freshmen on campus. Man, So it, it is out of control. And as you guys know, digital is forever. And the stories that you know I come across from parents whose kids have they took a picture, they sent it, uh, it then went public, and it's just devastating. Sure. So yeah. we're hopeful that this can kind of help uh, push some of those decisions off, you know, and give kids the space and make healthier ones and just look, hopefully put an end to this phenomenon. Definitely. Yeah, I, I definitely think this is a really cool app. I really, I really enjoy the fact that you're able to use the AI. Like, I don't think I've ever seen any other apps that are like that that do AI type things. It's usually URL based filtering or some sort of a, a you know black white list, uh, not necessarily an AI. And I really so how did how did you how did you get hooked up with the co the company in Israel to start this company to get, start Canopy to bring this to the U.S. Yes, I was in Israel in 2010 and met the founder of the parent company, which is called NetSpark, and is a guy named Moshe Weiss, and he was telling me about how technology was transforming his community. He's a, he's a rabbi there, he's got 10 kids, and how his hope was that he could have his community engaged in the digital world without being exposed to all the toxic content that sometimes comes with it. Mm -hmm. And he said, we're building technology that will someday help our community. And once we're ready, we're going to bring this to America so that you can help yours. And he's like, and I want you to sign up to do it. And this was the first time I'd ever met Moshe before, <laughs> like our first breakfast meeting. Um, and that was a pretty audacious thing. But Moshe's an audacious guy and so impressive. And we became friends over the ensuing seven years. And I had a couple of kids. Okay. And so the problem became a little bit more urgent and top of mind for me. And like true to his word. They built this amazing technology that got to the point that it's instantaneous. It's working in the background. It's not messing up your phone. It's not slowing things down. And they're out there and they're able to meaningfully um, safeguard people. And so when he called, I was wrapping up business school. He's like, you know what? Let's go do this. Let's bring this to American families. So I, I said, I'm in. I jumped in. We did some due diligence, raised around, and uh, been off to the races ever since. That's awesome. Now, Sean, you've mentioned, I mean, for you personally, and we get it, like as you become a, f a parent and you have this new radar up for not just your own personal well-being, but like the well-being of these of these children that are growing up. And Andy and I always half seriously, half jokingly talk about uh, how at any given time we're worried that we're screwing our kids up with not even knowing it, you know, kind of thing. Uh, you know, like th that's a real parent, like a, like – Am I doing this right? You know, am I, am I doing everything that I can to, you know, to set them up for success and things like that? Um, 
you know, just to play, I guess for you personally, um, what uh, being in the tech industry, being at Canopy, looking at kind of the the big the big picture. What if you were to look? I mean, if you're looking down the future, and I know it's hard to say, like a few years, the way technology goes to to be a major prognosticator about what's in the future. But what for you personally? Where do you see technology needing to go in this in this area? Um, what are you personally hoping for? Like, if you're thinking about your children in five years and and what their their needs will be, um, what are you hoping for in terms of development? And in in this can be yes, company wide, but then also just like your what you see as a father, as you see as a parent. Um, what what kind of uh, what keep what what makes you hopeful and like what keeps you up at night? Oh, such a good question. Um, well, I've got four kids, so I'm already up at night. So that's, um, <laughs> yeah, Andy and I are. We've, Andy and I have got the five and six year old is the youngest now, and so we've like just etched out of that. And uh, and I'm great. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. So yeah. <laughs> I hope my anguish sustains you. Yeah. So yeah. What what keeps me up at night is that our devices, and I mean both the phones themselves, the tablets, the computers the apps that are on them and then the platforms that we most frequently access have been designed to capture as much of our attention as possible to be as compelling as possible as entertaining and this is for social media this is for the games we play this is for pornography Mm -hmm. whether it's a b testing or the utilization of teams of neuroscientists at these big tech companies they've kind of figured out how to like hack the brain stuff and give you exactly what you want when you want it. That's going to keep you there. And it's, it's that dopamine rush and they've like, they've tapped into it. It's incredibly powerful and alluring. And I don't think that our brains uh, or our current social structure is designed to handle that level of temptation. And it's only going to get even more compelling, right? So like at Canopy, we talk about right now, my big concern is that a kid is going to access pornography on like a little two inch screen. And that's bad. Mm -hmm. But in five years, when AR and VR, like at the next level, like we will laugh about how quaint it was that that was like the compelling experience at that time. Mm. So I think that it's only going to get more enticing. The dopamine uh, rush is only going to get better. And this is not good for us, not leading us to happiness. So that's what makes me concerned. I think people are starting to realize that, but like the incentives are still so powerfully moving us in that direction. What gives me hope, this may sound a little bit bizarre, but I think what gives me hope first is that people aren't happy. Like they realize that this is not bringing about, they love their devices, but it's not making them fulfilled or healthy or happy. And more people are realizing. And you're seeing this in literature, like iGen kind of spoke by Dr. Jing Twenge makes the point. The social dilemma makes this point pretty persuasively. And I just, you know, all the anecdotes and your average teenager, they love their phone, but they also know that's kind of making them miserable. Mm -hmm. And it's borne out in the data, anxiety's up, depression's up, just all the metrics for like, are the kids doing okay? Like right now are kind of going down, but we recognize that. And so I think the antibodies will start to keep in. So the first is we recognize the problem. Second source of hope is like technology. We think it can't be like tech kind of exacerbated this problem, but we also want this to be a redemptive story where we can use technology to help solve it. And we're doing this in this space, but in other spaces, I think there's opportunities to make sure that your devices are serving your intentions, not just harvesting your attention. Or like another way to say that is there'll be tools or there'll be ways to help make sure that you're using your tech as a tool, not as a feed. And the last thing that gives me hope is that, again, this is brand new. It's like when the industrial revolution came about, we sent a bunch of kids into factories, arms were chopped off. It was horrible. And we kind of figured out that that wasn't the right way to do it. And like, over time, we figured it out and it wasn't great or pretty at the very outset, but we figured out how to navigate that. And I think we're in the early stages of doing that now. Mm-hmm. And already, I mean, just the fact that parents are asking these questions, kids are asking these questions, um, I think is a, is a good sign. Yeah. I think back to, oh, it's been about, oh, a year ago. This would have been just before, well, just before pandemic, actually. 
uh, had a group, kind of a little of a, a ad hoc focus group I had with some high school students, and and I, you know, I work with I work with young or did up in, for fifteen years work with young people, adolescents, and you know, we asked the question like, uh, we were asking the question, would you, would you allow like you as a teenager when you have kids, would you allow them to have uh, mobile devices? at age, you know, once they, once they were high schoolers and all of them said no. And I thought Mm -hmm. that was really telling because, uh, to your point, like there, there's like there, they they feel trapped. They're like, I need this phone to live my life, Mm -hmm. but it's killing me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And at the same time, it's this, this real like paradox sort of thing. And, and I would not wish this on someone that I deeply I deeply cared about. And I just, I wonder, like, I, I want to say, um, cause I think when you blame, when you outright blame technology for problems, you just blanket blame technology for problems, you lose. I think you lose every time when you're just like, well, it's, it's the tech, it's the technology. It's like, we don't, we don't like when I see, when I see the tractor, uh, plowing crops out in the field across from me, I don't go, yes, that's it's darn technology. That's it's terrible for people. I mean, it's feeding them, but it's terrible. You know, technology. It's like in it's and a of tool. itself is right. not bad. It's a tool, right? But mm-hmm. I think it's the uh, and what I hear you saying, Sean, is like we're just looking to, re- to redeem the use of the tool, right? To say mm-hmm. this tool is should be at our beck and call, how we decide to use it in a healthy manner, as opposed to. Um, I don't know these outside forces, these nefarious forces that are that are really uh, being pretty strategic about how they're they're coming at our kids and 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 us as adults too, obviously. Um, so, do you, I mean, Sean? Do you kind of have like a little bit of a of a warrior spirit, kind of a like a we're fighting back, we're taking this back, you know, for for the good? I mean, is that uh, is that a mindset that you that you guys have in a certain way? Absolutely. And I think it's been, it's been so important. And I'll say that in two ways. One aspect of it is trying to redeem technology. And so it's like, you know what? We're not going to cede this. We're not going to just let the status quo uh, operate in perpetuity. We're going to go find and forge a better way. So like on the broader question you were just raising on technology, like absolutely, we're going, we're in this, we're on a mission, like let's get after it. I think the other element, though, is on the specific question of pornography, where I think that spirit really has to come to bear here just because, look, it's it's an icky topic. Mm-hmm. It's taboo. People don't want to talk about it. There's yeah. a lot of shame involved. And I mean, whether you want to get into anecdotes or statistics, it is wrecking a lot of lives, whether it's at the marriage level resulting in failure to launch from people that get addicted to it and then just kind of get stuck and mired Mm -hmm. Um, or with kids when they're exposed to it at such a young age when their brain is developing and it's just like it hacks it. Uh, And so I think that is, excuse me, really problematic. I think it is at root of a lot of big problems and the things that we care about, if we can't keep it at, at bay and like push it out, especially for kids, all the things we care about are just a lot harder. So, yeah, we want to get out there and we want to fight it. And we recognize that there are going to be voices out there that say you're censoring yeah. or it's not that bad. And like we've encountered all of those. You know, our <laughs> initial product is really for kids. It's like, OK, fine. I'm censoring your eight year old from seeing this. Like, yeah, I'm guilty. Like, fine. Sue fine. me. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, you know, we um, we've got to change this because like it's it's beneath the surface right now. But I can just tell you it is. It is really bad out there. I have a hammer. I see lots of nails, so like full disclosure. But yep. the more you look at it, the more I think people realize, especially for the rising generation, just how uh, problematic this is. And like, we need to figure this out. Definitely. So you, you had made mention that it, it's for the, you know, your phones, your devices. Does it also work on like computers, laptops, things like that? Yes. So we are on all Android phones and tablets. We're on iPhones, iPads, uh, and we're on Windows computers and Mac computers. Awesome. So you really do cover everything that a child really could touch. Except you for you might say they provide a canopy uh, of support. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just made the connection. You made like a whole dad joke right <laughs> there. It was kind of dad jokey. It was. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's good. It all just came together for me. Uh, Sean, I mean, like, let me ask you this. Do you do you feel, I, I'm sure you have, it sounds to me like you have learned a ton in the last couple of years as you've been diving into all of this. Um, do you... Do you feel like uh, do you feel like your innocence has been lost in all of this? Like uh, for you person, like you personally, like if I were to talk to Sean four years ago, five years ago about this topic, about uh, both the technology, the whole thing, and then talk to Sean today, like what what's the difference for you personally? Like what? Because this is we we want to talk about the technology, we want to talk all about all of it, but we believe that there's a story, like a story behind every all of this, especially when someone is leading out on something like this, because clearly you've developed a passion for this. Um, what, what has the journey like been like for you personally? It has been a long road and my perspective has changed. I came into this at the very outset thinking that this was a problem. I am surprised week in and week out, even three years in, uh, by the depth of it. And the things that get me are, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, a personal example and then a story I heard from someone. Um, my son uh, is seven. And I, as a result of what I'm doing, I'm already having conversations with him and my nine-year-old daughter about these topics, which three years ago, I would have thought is crazy. It's like, he's seven. Like, what, like why on earth would you do that? And yet the number of stories, uh, like whether it's the stats of the age of exposure, the horror stories I hear from parents, and I feel like I've been pushed into a corner where I had to have that conversation earlier than I ever wanted, probably never wanted to have it. Mm -hmm. um, but I had to just because if he's not hearing it from his parents, right, he's learning it from Google or some stranger on the internet. And I just hate that. Like, I really mm -hmm. hate that that's the case. Um, and so that's like anecdotally for me. I then hear stories, and this is the one that, I mean, I, I hate to share, but uh, I was talking to a dad. He had a 16-year-old girl. She took a sex, sent it to her boyfriend at the time. They broke up, and then he sent it around the school. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me, and he says, my daughter used to be vibrant and energetic and just joyful. And since that happened, she's just become a shadow of her former self. She's been in counseling for two years. She had to transfer to a different school and she's just not the same person. So I wish that were like an anecdote that's isolated that I could kind of tell at the side. And it's, I mean, it is a sad story. It's a very sad story, but it's a real story. And I've heard so many of them. So listening to that, just, uh, I'm sad. I'm angry. I feel like there's an injustice. Um, and it, it's like motivation to like, get out there but it's also a little bit of a burden where it's like gosh we got to get this thing right um because right now the trajectory is a bad one so for me personally i don't know i'm not i'm being long-winded in this like it has been hard to like march forward to hear how this is happening to see what it's doing and not be there just yet but like know that we need to keep going forward but um forward we will go yeah definitely yeah i think uh i think andy and i would both agree i mean a big a, a big theme that we have here we talk a lot about is um, just the the sanctity and value of of persons in in general and and what we believe them being people that are made in the very image of God as well and so uh, it just a lot, so much of that uh, is uh, is er is being eroded uh, by stories just like you, like you shared where they, you know, where, where young kids don't see themselves, they make a bad decision. They are forced into something, whatever the case is, and it is out there forever. And then they, they fundamentally do not see themselves as a unique, be beautiful creation anymore. They see themselves as that the shame, the guilt, yeah. the, the, it goes deeper and darker. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, good golly, we've, we've got to turn a corner on this because yeah, I'm, the 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 story the stories that I've and again working with adolescents for fifteen years like the story and it just it's like every year it gets worse and worse and when I and from one year to the next I'm like certainly I won't hear a story worse than this and then and then you do and it's like well um something's got to something's got to change so 
Uh, Sean, we're super grateful for people like you and your team and what you're doing. If nothing else, we want you to hear loud and clear yeah. like this. We believe this is a battle worth fighting, and we believe that um, – you're gonna make you're gonna make significant change, and we're we're super honored that we also yeah. got to share in the story early, like early on in this journey. Uh, you know, years now, years from now, when everybody's like canopy, it changed it changed the world. Be like, yeah, we had, we uh, we we took a small part. We we listened to Sean and we just we spread his good his good news out there. Uh, we, yeah, so I'll uh, thank you for uh, what you've what you've shared for sure. So if any of our listeners want to to take up your service and get your app. What's the best way to do that? How much does it cost? Tell me the details there. Thank you so much for having me on and for asking that and also for inviting me to Joel's inaugural return, which is very exciting. Yeah, yeah <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh-huh, yep. Uh, okay, so to find out more about Canopy, you can go to our website, canopy.us, and there we have all the information about what the tech actually does, also what it doesn't do. We're always trying to be clear with parents because it's so important that you know exactly what we do and like where that boundary ends that you can make sure you're making the decisions accordingly. So canopy.us, we've got three different bundles. They all offer the same services, just different sizes. So it's okay. uh, three devices, five devices, and 10 devices effectively ranges from $8 to $16 a month for a subscription service built like that. Mm -hmm. So for 10 bucks a month, you can get five devices in your household protected. Yep. I'd um, pay that all I, day yeah, long, right, right all away. day long. Yes, hundred yeah. percent. It's still it, so worth it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and we um, if, if I may also just uh, add and offering an email address is never a smart thing on a podcast, but we are so hungry for feedback. We think we've got the most effective tool out there to prevent exposure to pornography. And we always want to get better. And uh, again, in Israel, this is already on two million devices. We're off to the races here in the States. Uh, but if you have ideas, feedback at highcanopy.com. That's H-I-C-A-N-O-P-Y.com. Uh, I read every one of those emails and, you know, we're just so excited to get out there and figure out how to raise awareness, how to make this better and how to, you know, help families flourish. That's really what's behind it. So that's, that's great. Uh, thanks again for being on. But before we let you go, we have one more thing to do. Now it's time for the dudes and dads pop quiz. Oh, did you warn Sean about this? I did at not all? warn oh, Sean about this. Fantastic! <laughs> we love, we love it, we love it. So, uh, Sean, we're going to subject you to some, to some, uh, a few questions that are are totally at random. Actually, that we we ask our guest uh, everything from uh, your favorite kind of soup to uh, the color of socks you're currently wearing. I mean, it could be anything. Uh, and, uh, it's really left, it's really left to fate. So, uh, literally, I'm literally pulling a card out right now. Um, oh, this is fantastic. So first question, Sean, on the dudes and dads pop quiz. Here we go. If there was a sandwich named after you, what would be on it? It would be, uh, it would be what in our family calls Cabo Precy, mozzarella cheese, tomato, and avocado. Ooh, that sounds amazing. It sounds fantastic. Yeah. And clearly Sean is more fancy than I am. So <laughs> that's awesome. Andy, next question. Oh, this is not even a great question. I mean for a, it's what's your favorite gadget? I mean, that's it. But go ahead. What's your favorite gadget? Favorite gadget. Uh if I had the video it's behind me, it's this little thing that's got a gear in it. You twist it up and then it uh it's like a spider that scurries around. But it, it basically Ooh. looks like a chicken with its head cut off and it's like frenetic. <laughs> energy um and i love it uh it was a gift to me because the person said it reminded me of me which i think was nice. kind of a backhanded <laughs> compliment, but, you're, like, um, you're like an arachnid sort of thing yeah yeah it's you know it's like the scurrying around just like frenetic chaos um beautiful and so there's beautiful. an element of that uh sean apart from canopy what are you most excited about right now I'm most excited about building a tribe in Austin, Texas. I've moved here five years ago in part because we had good community and it's only gotten better. So many people are moving here and we're in that season of life. We want to find folks to do life with. And I feel like, especially in the past year, like it's kind of come together in this awesome. amazing life changing, life giving way. And so I'm really amped up about that. Oh, that's the best dude. I'm so happy for you. That's awesome. Thank you. All right. If you could ask one person one question and they had to answer you truthfully, who and what would you ask? Oh, that's Ooh, cool. that's a good one. I'm trying to think of conspiracy theories that I could get to the heart <laughs> of. <laughs> there are so many. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah. I'll stay away from the modern ones. Try and keep the show. <laughs> We're going to go QAnon on real quick. Yeah. yeah. Gosh, this is, this is going to be a geeky one. And so, but it's the first one that comes to mind to avoid the awkward pause as I fumble here on the podcast. I had a math professor in high school who was obsessed with Fermi's last theorem. And I, if I remember the story correctly, he wrote in the margins as like, and, and the proof is so obvious, I won't even use the space here. And so for years and decades, mathematicians tried to figure it out and they couldn't do it. So I'd want to ask Fermi what on earth he was talking about. Oh, fantastic. That's, that's my nerdy response for the evening. Nerdy, and your mind might explode if you found out. So that that's yes. you, you're, you're taking a deep risk there. That who knows, yep. uh, Sean? Not to go morbid, but I. But our next question is: How would you like to die? Wow, I know. Took a real turn there. Yeah, jeepers! Uh, a long, long time from now. Yep. Uh, good. You know, there's there's the quietly peacefully in my bed approach or there's the like sliding into second phase i'll actually tell you uh, uh my grandfather of blessed memory had a heart attack he was 95 years old and he was lifting weights at the gym yes and i feel like that kind of uh vitality until the end was uh was pretty amazing all right well we want to thank you for being on the show today thanks so much for hanging out with us uh yeah, it's been it's been really good. Thanks for for teaching us about your the software. Yeah, and Sean, we're gonna we're gonna get the word out here, uh, and uh, we just want everybody to know: give a canopy a shot. Uh, it's uh, I, I'll pay all the dollars, all the money for it. Uh, guys, we're so grateful for each and every one of you. Uh, so grateful for Sean Clifford being on the show, uh, and and Andy, I'm I'm alive and I'm back, and hopefully we're gonna record more shows. So yep, absolutely. Until next time, our friends, grace and peace.